Good morning, and welcome to this morning's issue briefing, Fighting Ebola. My name is Ryan Moorhart, and I lead the forum's work on global health security. And in today's briefing, we'll hear from three distinguished panelists, each representing organizations on the front lines of efforts to strengthen health security in Africa. Across Africa, an acute public health event is reported every four days. And globally, the frequency of disease outbreaks has been rising. At the same time, we know that an infectious disease threat anywhere could be a threat everywhere. And these outbreaks and epidemics have considerable impacts on lives and livelihoods. In fact, our collective vulnerability to the societal and economic impacts of infectious disease crises is increasing. And today, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, responders are again battling Ebola now the second largest Ebola epidemic in history. The first being the one in West Africa several years ago that cost 11,000 lives, over 11,000 lives, and uh, over $53 billion to so those three affected economies. The outbreak in DRC has been called one of the most complex outbreaks ever. And meanwhile, we heard from Secretary General Guterres earlier this week that the United Nations only has 15% of what it needs to fight the Ebola epidemic for the remainder of the year in DRC. To tell us more about the situation in DRC, as well as overall efforts to protect lives and livelihoods in Africa from infectious disease threats, it is a privilege to welcome our three panelists. Brian Chirambo, acting representative here in South Africa for WHO. Nema Kaseje from the Médecins Sans Frontières, or Doctors Without Borders, and Dr. John Kennesong, Director from Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. We'll hear from each of our panelists, and then, in our remaining time, we'll take questions here from the floor. To get us started, Brian, could you provide some insight into the ongoing response, and what, what are our priorities now, but also going forward? Thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, the outbreak in the DRC, as you have given the background, mm -hmm. is actually the 10th in the DRC itself. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, DRC has had outbreaks of Ebola since 1972. Mm -hmm. And largely, they've been able to control them mm -hmm. because they've largely been in the outlying areas, uh, not in the big cities. The current out outbreak started in August 2018. Mm -hmm. And it has, up to date, we have just over 3,000 people who have been confirmed or who have had Ebola, both confirmed and uh, uh, probable cases. Yeah. And we have just r uh, gone over 2,000 deaths. So it has been quite a massive um, outbreak. Um, there have been almost 200,000 people who have been contact traced. Now, in terms of whether we are making progress with the response, we actually are, even though, of course, the numbers are quite big. Um, the response itself has been very good. We do have, we have had some political issues, mm. but in general, the leadership, the president has led from the front, which has been uh, very critical. Um, the different pillars of the response have been put in place. Um, the partners have really come together compared to the West Africa epidemic, where we did have some challenges with partnership in this, in this outbreak. The partnership has been very strong. Uh, and the other different pillars of the response have been very good. The public health response, um, the um, partnerships, mm -hmm. the resource mobilization, and other aspects have actually been quite good. So we are making good progress in terms of moving forward. Some of the aspects that have come in place is uh, vaccination, which is helping. Uh, new um, um, interventions, uh, drugs that are being used, they are investigational, but have actually been also used. Mm -hmm. There's been very good cross-border collaboration, sure. uh, which has been critical. And, uh, but what I wanted to highlight is the root causes mm. of the outbreak is actually the weak health systems. Mm. And that's where the focus really needs to, to, to be put in. For example, you have mentioned the cost of the response. Yeah. It's actually astronomical. Yeah. And uh, if you give, for example, the World Health Organization in its response, um, almost 80% uh, 
of our resources have actually gone to the response for the country over the last two years instead of strengthening health systems. Mm. So, but wh what do I mean by is the health systems? Now, when we look at the DRC, the DRC is number 176 out of 189 countries in terms of the Human Development Index. The uh, coverage of immunization is only 35%, so which shows that the systems are extremely weak. There are frequent outbreaks of measles and other, other diseases. The, um, and I think I've highlighted the cost of it, and I think you have also highlighted that. So I think three messages that I would like to emphasize are, one, unless we invest in the health systems, mm -hmm. we are always going to be chasing out, out of these outbreaks. We really have to address mm -hmm. the capacities of countries in terms of uh, international health regulations, ed, as defined by the international health regulations. Secondly, diseases don't apply for borders, uh, for visas across okay. borders. So the cross-border uh, interaction needs to really take place, and that's what will strengthen the response. And finally, the whole international community, private, public, and mm -hmm. all partners, civil society, have to really hold hands together. And it is good that in this response, that is happening. But that's critical for us to be able to address the uh, outbreak. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. John, let's go to turn to you, John. We just heard from, from, from Brian some of the progress and uh, priorities moving forward. Sitting at Africa CDC, what are you seeing there in DRC, but also as you look forward? Thank you, uh, Ryan, for including me as part of the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention uh, on this panel. We, um, there are several lessons that we learned from the West Africa disease uh, outbreak, which was devastating, which, which clearly um, position in no uh, uncertain terms the, the importance of disease threats for the economy and for the security of, of the region. So I, I reflect from where I, I sit. I mean, there's a saying that your, your stand in any issue is where you sit. So um, yeah. from the African Union uh, perspective, we, uh, there's a lot of things that get done. I've spent two and a half years at the African Union and, and trying to uh, stand up a new uh, center for disease control and prevention. And I think the, um, the turn to <clears throat> not highlight the work that the, the union or the commission is doing in the most appropriate way. Uh, when the West Africa Ebola outbreak occurred, the, the head of states took a decision to establish a Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, similar to what the United States did after the malaria the outbreak, after the, the, the Second World War. They established the US CDC. China established the China CDC in 2005 after the South outbreak and the European CDC. I think that much is not really talked enough, I think, as one of those big things that happened after that outbreak. So since then, we have a center up and running. We currently have uh, about uh, 60 people in the field, the theater of response for such a young organization, and entirely supported by the member states uh, funding. Okay, entirely, 100% of that, uh, the, 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 what we have uh, used in responding to this outbreak has been from the member states. I think that much needs to be, I mean, for such a political organization that is learning to transition from being a political entity strictly to and becoming a, 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 and establishing agencies that mm -hmm. go into implementation, I think that much has to be said. So let me um, say that the, each outbreak has its own characteristics. We, we thought we knew everything about the West Africa uh, uh, outbreak, and that next time we occur, we took the, we'll take the formulas, apply it in DRC, and then we will get it over. After all, we know the five things that you can do without even vaccines or treatment to, to control Ebola. We know them very well, contact tracing, uh, test the people, do uh, psych, uh, community engagement and psychological support. It's not the case in DRC because of what the colleague from WHO uh, uh, said. We, we are now in a zone where this conflict went on for, forever. I mean, the traditional tools that we know that are falling apart, uh, this community uh, distrust. So that has pushed our ability to respond uh, outward. I mean, and it's draining resources considerably into the, the, the theater of re re response. In all of that, the, the government's leadership is important in, in, in all of this. We have all aligning behind the, the leadership of the government of the DRC 
to respond because it is the responsibility of that country mm -hmm. to ensure the security, the health security of its citizens, not, not, not partners. So partners come in to support them. So I'm also agreeing with the, <clears throat> the colleague from WHO that capacity building, both national level and regional level and global level is very, very important. We have to structure the discussion in such a way that there's some governance as to what we do and, and, and begin to take ownership back to the, their country so that, and responsibility so that they can actually move forward with their own health system strengthening and as, uh, infrastructure. Let me just give you one, 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 share one reflection. During the uh, nine hour break, we wrote a commentary in the Lancet where we said, we've learned all these lessons from West Africa and the nine hour break, but the most important lesson is that we should have DRC, so support DRC to establish its national public health institute that can conduct surveillance all the time and pick these things early before they happen. Well, we're not given the chance to even finish that commentary, then the 10 hour break occurs. So that commentary became irrelevant because we were all again into a response mode. If we had, if DRC had had uh, their own national public health institute that conducted community surveillance, event-based surveillance, we would have picked up this outbreak very early on because if you trace the timing of this outbreak, when we were in Bandaka, in the western part of DRC, this outbreak was already going on. But because of we had no systems in place there, we didn't know. Okay, nobody knew that, that outbreak. And if you recall, the outbreak, the ninth outbreak was declared over like a week early, and then a week later, uh, this outbreak was on it. And it was not in the war zone at that time. It migrated into the, uh, the war zone. So I'm uh, totally in agreement with our WHO uh, colleague that is supporting the country to establish a, a functional national response uh, 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 unit or a, a, a public health institute, like what China did, what the Europeans did, what the United States did, is fundamental in that. It would have costed us half or even one-tenth of what we are currently putting into the theater of response. So at the African Union, that is the position we are taking. Uh, we, we are supporting the uh, uh, DRC to respond to it and put up the fire, but dialogues are already ongoing with the DRC with respect to how can we build a coalition and a uh, um, partnership to strengthen them to have their own national uh, public health institute that mm -hmm. can truly uh, help uh, in the network manner in the country. The population of DRC when uh, the first Ebola outbreak was, <clears throat> was reported in 1976 was uh, a little bit over 20 million, about 23 to be very specific. That was 1976. Today we are dealing in a country that has a population of about 90 million people. Uh, it means the same mass area. I mean, if, been almost uh, quadruple the number of people living there. They are encroaching into different areas to, for their protein needs, uh, disrupting the ecology in a way that I mean was is unprecedented. And uh, uh, besides the weak systems, we have to pay attention to the reemergence of these diseases. The, the Ebola strains we are dealing with mm. in the, this current outbreak are new transmissions from from uh, zoonotic transmissions from the reservoir. Okay, there are two new subtypes, <laughs> not even genotypes, subtypes yeah. that have been introduced into the population. So again, that suggests that we need a more holistic approach to this and, and, and work with the government of DRC and put them at the forefront of this response. Thank you, John. And, 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 and John, one of the things you mentioned was, was applying formulas. You know, we've gone through this now the 10th the outbreak, and, and as you said, we're applying the formula from the, from the ninth and, and we're hitting a wall. And one of the reasons, uh, Nema, that we've been hitting a wall is, and John mentioned it, is community mistrust. Mm -hmm. Could you say a little bit more about what it takes to, to build trust in communities like this during such a crisis? Mm -hmm. Um, so first of all, thank you for the opportunity to be here and to thank participate you. in this uh, panel. Um, and I'll start out by saying that trust is absolutely, it's fundamental mm -hmm. to any kind of health uh, intervention. Um, right from when someone decides to even come to your, to your facility to get care. So if they don't trust your facility or what you're providing as a solution, they will not come. Mm -hmm. And once they get there, if they don't trust you, they won't tell you about their symptoms. So there's no way you can actually find out that something is wrong. And once you give them the diagnosis, if there's no trust, they won't agree with the treatment, they won't agree with being quarantined, so trust is, is fundamental. And in addition to um, the mistrust, there is also 
ongoing misinformation mm -hmm. about, uh, about the outbreak, about what, uh, what partners are coming to do, mm -hmm. what the humanitarian is coming to do. Um, so that is also an issue in addition to the mistrust. And I believe that the, the solution to, to the mistrust and to the misinformation is that it's not, not just uh, community engagement, because mm -hmm. engagement sometimes means you go in, you, you, you talk to the leaders, and it's, it's, it's giving them leadership, it's mm -hmm. putting them in the driver's seat, giving them the opportunity to frame the issue um, and so that you also understand, well, how do they perceive this? Do they actually even see Ebola as a problem? Mm -hmm. And what do they feel is the solution? Mm -hmm. And um, do their priorities align with what you believe is it? So that's absolutely important at this stage because what we're doing, although we're making progress, the situation is still not under control. Um, and, uh, and the only way, I think, is to not only engage with the communities, but put them in the leadership role so that they're framing and developing the solutions together with all the partners and mm -hmm. the government. And I think that that will be the, the, only, um, the only way forward. The other, um, uh, the other thing I'd like to highlight, in addition to what my uh, co-panelists have, have uh, discussed, is the fact that women and, ch and children are, are more affected by this outbreak than others. So 70% of the deaths of the cases are in women and in children. Mm -hmm. and, and women, because they're the caretakers, they're the one, when someone is sick in the home, it's the woman who will take care of that person. So they're more exposed to it, and uh, they, there are more cases in women. So that's something that we need to be aware of, and mm -hmm. we should be inclusive of women. Mm -hmm. So women should also be in the room, at the table, framing the issue and coming up with, with solutions for this outbreak. Thank you, Nema. You know, on, on the point on, on women and children, I think it's also the case, and, and the, the panelists can agree, I hope, that, that not only are women and children more affected by the, the, current the, the, the current epidemic, but actually because of a lack of capacity, that one of the first areas of a health system that money is pulled from to support the the crisis in the response is mm -hmm. from maternal and child health. Yes. And so this is a, a challenge that is, um, mm -hmm. you know, has cascading consequence mm -hmm. in addition to mm -hmm. sort of being uh, devastating in its own right. Mm -hmm. uh, we'd like to turn to the floor now. Thank you to, to our, our panelists uh, for those interventions. We'd like to turn to the floor and take some questions. Uh, if there are any, we can take them in rounds. Uh, and then if there are none, we can, we also, I have a couple more of my own myself. So are there questions from the floor? It would be great if there were. So please, we have a microphone coming your way. Thanks. Could you say more about the cross-border effort? So, for example, between DRC and Rwanda, how that uh, is that done on a bilateral basis, or is that brokered by the AU, or how does that, how those mechanisms, uh, but affected? Sure. And sir, could you introduce yourself? Would you mind? Uh, I'm sorry, Andrew Jones at Linklater in London. Sure, great. And are there others? So again, I would like to take them in rounds if we could. Sure, please, ma'am. Hi, um, apologies, I came a couple minutes late, so if my question has already been addressed, you just ignore it. Um, I guess I was wondering, it, it, all the recent news about vaccines that seem to be working and treatment that seems to be working, I guess uh, my cynical view had expected that it would take longer for the global pharmaceutical <clears throat> industry to actually come up with solutions for Ebola since it, um, uh, there often can be a bias against uh, diseases in, in places like Africa. And so I'm curious what, what you all think drove the response from the medical industry to actually work on treatments and vaccines and if you think that has gone well and, and what we could learn from it. Thank you. Oh, can you introduce yourself too as well? Oh, I'm sorry, Katie Hill with Liquid Telecom. Sure, thank you. And we could take one more before we turn to the panelists, if there's another one. Otherwise, great. So to the, to the panelists here, we have a question on cross-border and cooperation at, at the border, and a question on the, the role of the, of the vaccine that we're seeing in the current response, and maybe what it has taken to get there, and what's, ne what's next. Uh, defer. So maybe I could respond first yeah. to the cross-border, and then the others could, could add. So it's, it's actually all the above. Basically, there has been uh, cross-border work that's happening between the countries themselves, bilaterally. So um, 
is I, I think I didn't mention, so um, the DRC is right in the middle of nine countries. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the challenges. Secondly, the borders are extreme, extremely porous. Mm -hmm. And there are four particular countries uh, where this is, this is worse, and there are another uh, five where, where it's not as bad, but it's still a problem. So the cross-border work has been very crit critical at bilateral. But in addition to that, um, and I think uh, John may talk about the AU, but in addition to that, the World Health Organization has also worked with the East African community and the West African community to actually do some simulations and assist the communities themselves to begin to address some of the cross-border issues. Um, so basically, it's actually at both levels because it's critical. And part of the big problem is between each country, there's so much movement um, uh, between them each, each day, actually. So I think I'll hand it No, absolutely. To the, the, um, let me just pick out on that. I think the, um, there's been a concerted effort, I think first of all by WHO and in Goma, they had a meeting, uh, I think last month, where I think at a technical level, brought those, uh, I'll call them front line states together and to discuss technical uh, collaboration. But together with WHO and the African Union Commission and Africa CDC, we will be convening a meeting, a ministerial level meeting on the 21st of October. Uh, in Goma, where you bring in all countries and DRC together to agree on a framework of coordination. I think that meeting uh, invitations are being sent out together with um, the Commissioner of Social Affairs and Dr. Moeti uh, uh, discussed in Yokohama when we were there last week, and that, that is going to, I mean, uh, uh, be addressing that issue that we, we thought that bringing everybody together so that we have a framework of understanding on how to do this will be um, very, very important. I think. Um, it will be the first of its kind that, I mean, all countries, not just the frontline countries, are coming together um, to agree on a, a way to share information, uh, share data, and, uh, 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 and, uh, and address cross-border issues. I think one of the things that um, which speaks to the importance of the question you just raised is the collaboration between DRC and Uganda. Yeah. When the, the case that was dictated yes. in Uganda, in Kasisi, happened, it was because of the good information sharing, not mm -hmm. necessarily data, and mm -hmm. that trust that existed. I mean, when I went to Uganda, was there uh, almost, not almost, on the same day that Dr. Moiti was there, we were in the EOC with the Minister of Health, and he said, she said, this is a really a good example that should be highlighted, where immediately that family got into a bus and was driving to um, a Uganda, <laughs> she was called up and they, they kept, they put everything in check and tracked to. Because our system, even though we, have, we may have the best surveillance systems in place and it's only as good as the information that you get. So that particular piece of just trust and sharing that information avoided a disaster that could have happened, possibly happened in Uganda despite the extensive preparations that Uganda had put in place. So imagine if they, they didn't go to Kasi, they went through an uncontrolled border into maybe Kinshasa, it will be a, a disaster. So that is so important that they need to coordinate efforts, they build their trust among member states and share information and data. It's another area where trust is coming up. We've talked about, Nema was talking about trust in the response, but now we're talking about trust across borders in, in sort of mutual capacities, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's for information sharing or just in the health system itself to support a response. And we have seen that in, in Uganda twice now. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, to the, there's a, any comments on the question here we have on, on the role of the vaccine, what is meant that a vaccine is there and um, implications of the vaccine? Yeah, let, let, let me take, take, take on that. I think we have more, better tools in the 10th outbreak than we had in the 9th outbreak and than we had in the West Africa outbreak collectively. I mean, in West Africa, outbreak was not controlled because of vaccines or uh, uh, treatment. Mm -hmm. I mean, the vaccines came, if you recall, towards the end. Of the, it was controlled because of the traditional tools that we have, we know, in dealing with Ebola. I think that is uh, very, very clear. Now we have even better tools. The challenge we have now is the application of those tools. Mm -hmm. I mean, and the Ebola uh, situation we all know is it all centers around finding the individual mm -hmm. and the contacts and making yes. early, especially for the treatment, as we just read yes. a few weeks ago, find it early, uh, treat them with those monoclonal antibodies, you have a 90% chance of success. But the, thing, the key word is finding them. Mm -hmm. I mean, the vaccines will only work if you find the contacts and then you vaccinate them. Now, with the issues that uh, you, we just raised about community cooperation, I don't want to use the word resistance, but cooperation, yeah. 
it, it's, uh, it becomes a, a, a problematic. But somehow I still see that thanks to this, the vaccine that has been used, we truly don't know where we would have been with this outbreak if we didn't have the vaccines. I mean, it could have, it would, it would have been probably, my estimate, non-informed by saying is that if we didn't have a vaccine, yeah, this outbreak would have been completely out of, out of control. So I think we really, and if you clock the, um, every morning at 9.30, the, I mean, I coordinate uh, the emergency operations center from, uh, uh, from Addis Ababa. I connect with Goma, Benin, uh, Kinshasa, then the places South Sudan, Uganda, places that, that I have people stationed in. And you clearly see that the week that you have uh, uh, violence, the new cases go up. Mm. And the week that I mean, you settle in and there's calm there, the cases go down. So it's, uh, it's I mean, I agree with uh, 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 Brian that you, well, the response is good. We, we're doing all we can do, but without stopping the violence, the medical interventions will be, um, uh, will take us a while to get the, to, to reap the benefits. Maybe I could add that, I think again, coming back, it's, it's the holistic response that's going to be critical. So definitely vaccines have had a, a big impact um, in the new, um, new drugs. But I think as John has said, you still have to find the people. Even when you vaccinate, the most effective way is what we call ring vaccination. So you actually have to find somebody who is uh, the case, and then you vaccinate those around. So it's still critical that the system is working. So, and I think you gave the example of, of Uganda. Obviously, the cross-border interaction was critical, but also the response in Uganda in, I think it took about two weeks from the time of the death of the pastor, um, the crossing of the family to go to the funeral, coming back, and then the cases, and then investigating them. Within two weeks, the response was in full gear, and they were able to ensure that they actually address all the issues, the contact tracing, etc. So for me, the critical thing still is that response, the systems have to be in place. And these additions will obviously make it much easier if you've got vaccines and the new investigational drugs would also assist. And just to build on that, we won't find the cases unless there is trust, unless the community believes in what we're doing, believes in our interventions. And um, I agree with you that you deploying these, uh, the vaccines, the new medication in a weak health system is very, very challenging. And so I think something as what, that we need to think about uh, in addition to, to the emergency response is, as you mentioned earlier, building the health system and strengthening the health system and making sure that we, from the humanitarian sectors especially, we're not creating a parallel system because a lot of the cases are still dying in centers that are not Ebola centers. Mm -hmm. um, and so we need to make sure that whatever response is ongoing is integrated within the health system that is there and it's used as an opportunity to, to strengthen the health system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's right. Maybe I could just That's add right, yeah. one example of the system, which mm -hmm. unfortunately I couldn't show the pictures. Yes. But in Uganda, when this happened, they, you could show actually the dashboards that we have helped them to develop. And one of the aspects, for example, was just looking at each facility. Mm -hmm. Are the frontline workers mm -hmm. clear about what Ebola is yes. and how to respond? Mm -hmm. We could show in a dashboard, and Uganda has done that, by facility, which facilities have um, frontline workers who actually know what to do and which ones don't have. And it's shown graphically. It's then very easy to know where the gaps are mm -hmm. and actually address them. Mm -hmm. So the whole issue of the health system is so key. key. And regardless of what else we throw in, yeah. if the system is not, not working, working. Yeah. it's going to be very expensive yeah. and we may still not make as much and progress. And it won't be sustainable over time. Exactly. So for working within what's in place, we're reinforcing it and we're ensuring sustainability all the time. Thank you, panelists. We're at the end of our time today. So thank you to each of you for providing remarks and for continuing your work to strengthen health security in Africa. And thank you to our guests here. And enjoy the rest of our forum on Africa. Thank you. <laughs>